Claude is saying, like, so destructive. Oh, because in the yeah. 16 millimeter, <laughs> in the 16 millimeter educational film, they're like, don't do this, kids. And they're like breaking windows and things and yeah. so destructive. <laughs> that is maybe my favorite moment. In I know. Life. Me too. <laughs> Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> Daddy's all right. They just seem a little, a little weird. weird. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, man. oh, boy. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, man. That song is so good in this movie. Um, it really is. Um, yeah. It's, oh, it's great. It rips. We'll get into it. Rips. it. Yeah, we definitely yeah. will. Uh, welcome to uh, One Fucking Hour, everybody. Of course, this is the show where we talk about one movie for one fucking hour. I am Evan Husney, and joined, of course, I got to my left over here. We got Tom Fitzgerald. Tom, what's going on? You must be pretty hey, excited. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you could say that. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a big classic for me, so I'm glad we got around to it. All right. And we got Marcus Herring. What's going on, Marcus? Hey, I'm just happy to be here. Oh, yeah. We're happy to have Did you. Did you see the film? All. <laughs> have i seen <laughs> what what yeah no i've done this movie i've seen it when i was you know a teenager okay 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 uh all right well, everybody. you don't believe me <laughs> no <laughs> you said just that? happy to be here <laughs> yeah, never yeah. mind you said i'm happy to be here and you were like uh we're, never we're jiving we're jiving with you man <laughs> uh all right so yeah it's a friendly banter for the opening of the show all right we'll, we'll, the chemistry. I'm no, longer, like, yeah. I'm no longer happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? Nothing. All right, here we go. Uh, we are talking episode number 48, guys. I Close, can't believe it. Closing in on 50. Kind of hard to believe. But uh, episode <laughs> really? 48, one fucking hour on Jonathan Kaplan's 1979 film, Over the Edge. All right. You ready for the clock? No, but let's do it. Okay. I'm going to start that <laughs> clock. Here we go. Bam. All right. little background before we get into this whole conversation here. Um, all right. So Over the Edge is a uh, supremely authentic portrait of late 70s teenage rebellion in the dawn of a sterile suburban frontier. It's also a snapshot uh, of a culture on the brink of Reagan's America, telegraphing both the war on drugs and youth counterculture. Set within the confines of a planned community where material-obsessed baby boomer parents and authority figures clash with the local youth, Over the Edge depicts a generational divide that erupts into an all-out war precipitated by the murder of local dirtbag hero Richie, played amazingly by a 14-year-old Matt Dillon. Guys, over the edge. This is a this is a huge one for me too. I mean, I I, I probably yeah. only saw this for the first time maybe five or six years ago. So I, I'm a little oh. bit of an over the edge newbie. But man, it quickly shot up to one of my favorite you know films of the '70s. Again, we love talking about movies from '79 <laughs> and 1980, 81 yeah. on the show. And yeah. this I, I wonder what the percentage is. The breakdown. Yeah. It's like 75 percent probably. I want to know. know. <laughs> it's insane, but this is right up there uh, as one of the all-timers of that specific category. Uh, but yes. anyway, l this is a really special movie, um, and uh, you know. But I think it's really fascinating because we're going to get into a lot here talking about this movie. But I think it's equally fascinating with the movie is how troubled and weird and confusing the history of the release of this film was because it didn't like you know hit theaters and was a you know success or a failure i mean basically it had a it had a hard time coming out isn't that right tom yeah i mean uh so okay so it's the late 70s like we're saying and uh for whatever reason a bunch of gang films had come out about 1978 to 79 and um, right. there were two of them in particular the warriors and uh, uh boulevard nights about la gangs and there were actual incidents at the screenings in the theater, just outside the theater, because I believe, from what I understand, well, rival gangs would come to see the same movie. So they'd so have a bunch of clowns with baseball bats showed up at the Warriors <laughs> to uh... Right. Exactly. <laughs> wow. So, okay, anyway, so the, so the studios got spooked. And I think, so it's like Warner Brothers. And this was supposed to be uh, Orion, their subsidiary, Orion Pictures' first film. Actually, a little wow. bit of film history. 
but they pulled it. Um, and their, uh, some say that was their excuse was, well, let me actually back up slightly because, um, the film gets made. Warner brothers was kind of having a lot of notes, quote unquote. So it felt like it was going to have a shaky time. The, I think the director was thinking like, they don't know how to, or want to package this critics liked it, but what Warner brothers did was, um, distribute a, a pre trailer before the uh, the exhibition and it looks just like you're going to a horror movie Weird. and we're going to show it later yeah we're going to show it later in the screening i have a very rare copy of the original over the um uh, edge trailer and it looks wow. like the brute like the kids have like red eyes and they're just staring at you and there's ominous music like huh. so, <laughs> so the thing is people would see the trailer and then they'd see over the edge and they'd go this isn't a horror movie at all Weird. fuck you yeah. yeah. So, um, so, it's so like then, a killer um, kid kind of thing. It's like a killer kid thing. Is like they're, they're, they're possessed. Kids? You'll see Weird. in the trailer. It's like uh, that's wild. It's like that's the, the opposite. Like the, <laughs> the opposite I themes. The yeah. No, I know. It's it's a well. They didn't. It's like one of the you know. It's classic studio stuff. They're like, what do we do with this? We don't like it. We didn't really want to make it anyway. That kind of thing. So let's just try to throw it away as a horror movie in, in drive-ins. So no one liked it, but like a couple critics liked it in the preview markets. Still, then some say Warner Brothers used as an excuse that there was uh, street gang violence at gang movies. So they just pulled it. It didn't play really until later in 1981. And then they made another mistake and they had it in their sort of fine arts subsidiary. Huh. And that got, that got the film in places like New York City at the highest of art houses, like the most Tony kind of uh, upscale art houses where they have carrot cake in the concession stand, that kind of thing. <laughs> and it did like, uh, it did like, okay there, that's not a good place for it either. So it was like, eh. and, but uh, Vincent Capney, the New York times guy kind of put it in his top 20 or whatever around that time. Uh, so it got some critical cool. notices, but still nothing like people weren't seeing it and it wasn't connecting at all. Cut to 1984 and it played constantly. And I can personally attest to this on the movie channel or Showtime or something. HBO, Cinemax, right? it, I think it was a big HBO. I don't know. I don't know exactly. But um, I was a kid then. And of course, I really you know, connected it instantly. I was like, what? I'm hearing like the Ramones and like first Van Halen album. So I watched it every time it was on and all my friends did. And so I know it like the back of my hand. Mm. But this is where it broke. This is where it did become a thing. Mm -hmm. It's one of those cable babies. Because like we've talked about, this is not the first time. We talked about this when films tank in the theater often they would overplay at ca on cable because right. they were cheap and the cable station went well we can just play this one for 99 cents you know unlike playing uh, the shining like once a week on right. cable you know what i mean right. so that got people to really see these films you know um so anyway that's it and that's my story i did really see it a lot as a kid and I was subscribing to Hit Parader magazine at the time, <laughs> and just an anecdote. And I was very excited about their poll of who the best guitar player in the world is, and that's literally when this film was playing like uh, every day uh, before I went to school and stuff. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's all. So, so wow. it so it did connect, and it connected with people like Kurt Cobain. I was just gonna uh, say. And, I mean, that's kind of what yeah. I I was gonna pick that up right there, real quick. Is that that's what I sort of remember about you know th this film's infamy was because it was i think kurt cobain's like favorite film or something or one of you yeah. know and and he really connected changed his life it. it changed his life and he really found that it was you know super authentic and spoke to him in many ways and so that was cool i mean you, it was cool because you'd always find out about cool bands through kurt cobain but it's also cool to find out right. about a really cool movie like yeah. this for him but i also there's, love there's that a page it's, in his yeah. journal about it you know what i mean he does talk right about it oh wow that's awesome yeah marcus yeah Oh, but just, you know, the, the same, uh, basically, because I came online, like, you know, as a you know, as a teenager, like, in the 90s. So this movie was already, like, sort of in the cultural fabric somewhat, you know. It wasn't, like, a lost thing anymore because people, like, Kurt were mentioning it. And then also, like, uh, you know, uh, Richard Linklater, you know, Days of Confused yeah. and, like, uh, Harmony Korine, like, kids. You know, this would come up in interviews. You would read it here and there so like it, it was already a movie that was a touchstone it landed really hard with the Xers, apparently you know it was already like a big touchstone movie by the time i came on so like i it's never 
hearing that it was like that it wasn't at the box office and stuff. Like, I, I think we were arguing earlier, like about whether or not the Wipers song "Over the Edge" was a reference to it or not, and like uh, you know, you were like, "I don't think so," and I was like, "Well, he did work at a movie theater. Greg Sage worked at a movie theater in '78, but." You know, there's a chance. I mean, it, it probably didn't even play in Portland, right? It only opened in like a no. few American cities, so maybe he didn't even see it. But you know, between when it came out and when that album did, so it's it's um, it was Nobody never a lost movie for me. Nobody saw it till Cable, you know. And just the just to but, put the button on Kurt Cobain a little bit, he does write one page of it is in the um, his journals. But you know, the big thing actually is that uh, "Smells Like Teen Spirit" video, right? Uh, He's just told the director, he just told the director and maybe showed him the videotape. He went, I want that. So what he's doing, Mm -hmm. his idea for the Teen Spirit video is to have a a high school riot, you know, so. um, That and rock and roll high school. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And it's also, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's totally amazing. And, um, but this thing too, like looking at the movie and when it's coming out and uh, probably the studio being afraid of it or not knowing how to classify it. It's also interesting to put into the context of like, you know, yes, there was rock and roll high school, right? And what year was that? Was that 78? 78. 78, right? So which is interesting that they wouldn't see this as kind of like a a, a way like to sort of play into that market with this movie because I think you definitely could have. But there also wasn't that many kind of high school films that would become yeah. much more popular into the 80s. And so this like John movie, Hughes. Yeah, yeah. The John mm-hmm. Hughes. Stuff. So this is really credited as being a forerunner to all of those you know that whole yeah. 80s stretch of high school yeah you know, the director films. is is uh as noted that there's a quote like in the commentary like i'm the connective tissue this film with rebel without a cause and uh 16 candles i, had, I mean i always had the same thought when i was reading that when i was reading watching the re-watching the movie i was seeing this continuum of like rebel without a cause and uh you know all the way uh, uh wild in the streets over the edge you know pump up the yeah. volume uh yeah. river's edge you know heathers. days of confusion like heathers yeah there's this like continuum of of yeah. teen films it just bubbles right below the well, surface of like I, mega hit movies can i just say jonathan kaplan you know the director uh he just had kind of like a, a one phrase sentence for warner brothers he said rebel without a cause 78 you know, and, they, and that's that's what they signed up for. That's what they, they I, I think they were disappointed. I think what they didn't like about it, guys, was, um, you know, how it's not like marketed like uh, Rock and Roll High School. It was a, it, the thing is, there's a downer. You know, it's mm. not fun. True. You know? Yeah. I mean, it is fun, but it's not like right. entertainment. Right. Well, yeah, right. And and I think it's, well, it's interesting because of the, the Rebel Without a Cause thing. Definitely, I thought about when I was watching this, and I think this kind of dovetails into maybe a first start, like an, uh, like another talking point here, mm-hmm. is the idea of with Rebel Without a Cause, it's obviously like, you know, here you have teenagers standing up, you know, to the establishment, to the, the sort of square, you know, life of the previous generation. You have the generational clash, you know, thing sort of going on. And that's, you know, then, of course, after Rebel Without a Cause, you have the 60s, you have counterculture, you have everybody goes wild and crazy, and then the pendulum swings back again. And now we have everything leaning up to conservatism, and you have, the, you know, Ronald Reagan about to get elected eventually. And so I yeah. think it's interesting how that sort of plays. It's very cyclical going from... You know, Rebel Without a Cause, the, you know, the movie and the time that it came out into this. Right. And I think a huge part of Over the Edge, I think what this movie is even about. It's funny. I read a someone's college dissertation that they did on Over the Edge, which is pretty great, actually. And they really Ooh. talked about how this movie is about real estate. That's what it's really about. And it's. Oh, about, my God. Like, yeah. Uh, two seconds. Sure. Kurt's note in uh, journals is like. It's about bad parents, alienation, and real estate development. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> that's what Kurt exactly. said. <laughs> exactly. That's amazing. That's that's incredible because it. I, I think it really is. You know, in a lot of ways, it's that whole you know white flight thing. You know, where all yeah. the white people are Absolutely. you know panicking, Suburbs. leaving the city, and you have all these new suburban like developments that are sort of happening. And um and and it's really interesting watching this movie is that it sort of feels like these kids are like prisoners. You know, in this 
artificial society you have all these you know materialistic you know people who you know all these boomers who have their things there's actually some great lines in the film that really play up you know play this up and as a major theme in the film remember there's that one guy who's got the firecrackers in his uh in his car that gets set off or whatever one of the kids yeah the visiting uh, investor guy yeah the visiting investor and they put the fireworks in his car and he basically corners you know carl the main kid the star the star of the, the star of the film you know uh uh he he pulls carl's father to the side and says you got a lot more than juvenile trouble Seems to me like you all were in such a hopped up hurry to get out of the city that you turn your kids into exactly what you're trying to get away from. And it's kind of interesting, you know, in terms of just like, you know, how this this movie is something that's really dealing head on with the darkness, the hellish nightmare of, you know, suburban development, suburban and bored teenagers. Well, this is probably a good time. You know, we haven't discussed it. It's based on a true story, (laughs) you know, so this happened. Uh, Foster City in the Bay Area, around there, uh, 1974, and what we're talking about are these like Mc Mc towns, you know, like McDonald's Mc towns, where uh, it's a kind of social engineering where it was like you know it's marshland, and then they're like, well, why don't we just have an entire community? And like you said, it's white flight, but it's also just like, um, what would be? Let's make the perfect place for 30 something you know boomer adults. And they didn't factor in teenagers. So this happened in real life in Foster City. And it was much worse, the riot. 150 cars were destroyed Whoa. in Foster City. Yeah, I know. Wow. And um, a cop was badly injured, not killed. And I'm spacing on it. Um, oh, they cut all the power in the town, the teenagers. Amazing. It was really hardcore shit. So what happened is the San Francisco Examiner did a whole uh, essay or essays on it. Uh, which I really want to look up. Um, and um, the it was like writers, teenage crime uh, wave or something. It was like a teenage crime wave, like panic sort of thing, right? Kind like, of, yeah, I guess. Yeah. So. Well, they were just like, you know, just examining like like a hand rigging thing. Like, why did this happen? So anyway, the writers of the film, ah, Charlie Hunter and this other guy, shit. Charlie Is Hunter Tim, wound up. Tim, Tim Hunter, I think. Tim, Tim Hunter, Hunter Tim and Hunter. Bruce somebody. Uh, I'll look it up. Go ahead. Yeah, but Tim Hunter, who later did yeah. River's Edge, which is not dissimilar, of course. Charlie anyway, Haas. so they just... Charlie Haas and Tim Hunter. So they just read this in the Examiner. I love movies that come from headlines, yeah. like the, the this, you know. And then so yes. so anyway, so uh, that's so this really happened uh, in Foster City, and um, they they went down there with uh, with Kaplan, and they interviewed. They spent two weeks with the kids. Wow. So they really just sort of like walked around with like the whole world and. Uh, maybe if you guys don't mind i want to maybe dovetail into this and open it up to you guys Mm -hmm. um there's so many masterful strokes in this film it's not a hack film at all and it's not cliched and big ups to the writers and kaplan even the producer because they they wanted to i'm just going to give you one example of what caught my eye oh only the four principles of this film are real act four or five are real actors uh you know the um um you know, Claude and, and Carl and, uh, of course, Richie. Matt Dillon. And, uh, right. Yeah, and then like, uh, like Vincent Spano. But my, my point is everyone else are just local California and Col- – because they shot in Colorado in, in another equivalent, uh, you know, development like this, um, like Foster City. And so they're not actors. There's tons of ad-libbing, as you can imagine. Like it was just like, go. What would you say if cops were – shaking you down for drugs you know like uh you know like he's looking for his dick or whatever yeah. you know like <laughs> yeah, dead yeah. Kid, you know dead kid never rats on a kid you know that kind of stuff yeah. so anyway i just wanted to update you guys i think that makes a huge difference because what, what what had happened was initially they went to high schools and and the, the the school would always um like at the school where they shot it they would put all the theater kids in front of the film producers and they would be like you know like uh yeah like, right uh, you know, yeah. like, uh, hey, you got get your gun or whatever. And it's like, no. So they just got the dirt ball kids from, yeah. a, you know, the smoking section around the back of the school. Yeah. And they're in the film. And no one would have done that. And that's the kind of risky move that I don't think Warner Brothers liked. So No. And wh- it's, it's, it's on- verite. There's that thing, that verite thing, guys. That like. Yes. Yeah. Documentary aspect. There, yeah. There's, there's one thing I also read, too, where actually a lot of the kids – uh, who were cast and actually when you see the the credit scroll at the end of the film the first person they credit is who did the casting which you know obviously is a oh, shit. You know, is a huge <laughs> part of the film but i also read that a lot of the casting of the kids was done out of new york which explains why in the beginning uh, 
the lead actors. Well, like, well, I don't know because there's a lot of New York accents flying around in this movie. <laughs> that was cracking me up. Yeah, yeah. this time, this watch yeah. through. <laughs> it's like, hey, hey what are you doing? Eh? With my secretary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, what that are you was doing? making me laugh this time. Yeah, too. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I felt that that was kind of a funny thing. But the other kind of interesting tidbit is, yes, you're right. It was shot in Colorado, but what? I, but further examination, it was the neighboring suburb to <sighs> Columbine, yeah. which is I know. ten chilling. miles away chilling to know yeah. how about obviously, them apples how about them apples That's so that nuts. was crazy little thing you know a little factoid on that but yes uh, to, uh, go ahead i think that the, 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 what Tom, that's very dark uh um but i think that the you know the 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 choice to use real people and you know is one of the great achievements in this film that they got the, they actually got it to work and it works so well and yeah. i think it is part of the reason why it connects with people so much uh you know obviously like uh, a lot of us did grow up in the suburbs or small towns. Where there's nothing to do. That was, oh, that yeah. was my situation. Me too. You know, I'm growing up in a small town. There was a rec <laughs> center and like that we would go to sometimes. My band would play at. But, uh, you know, it would close. But when it closed, there was nothing to do. We didn't like, you know, uh, resort to violence or whatever. But there was tons of kids on drugs. You know, I do remember a kid showed up to school on acid. You know, it's a small town, nothing to do. Yeah. You just, Same here. And at nighttime, you're just you are literally just hanging out at the park. Maybe a grocery store, walking around a grocery store or something. You know, it's, parking lots. Yeah, oh, yeah, parking lots. It's can I say wild. what? Can I say what we used? To, I mean, this is what people used to do in the suburb I grew up in. I mean, like the thing to do, the bored teenager dirtbag thing to do was to stand in a circle in the Wendy's parking lot, bro. That's what that's what my town used to do. To kill time, Wendy's wow. parking lot. Yeah, you know what I'm saying that's funny. Um, yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, uh, if we want to talk about the actors, like. Um, you guys were saying the New York stuff. And by the way, they tried to cover Carl's accent by saying, you know, if you heard that, it's like, well, I lived in New York for a while and we moved here. So this <laughs> yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah, no, no, no. So let's 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 want to clarify. So the actors were yeah, New York people. But Carl, the actor was an, who played him was an actor. But Matt Dillon, that's a crazy story. Not far from where I'm from in Westchester. Amazing. It was a legendary story, like two towns away. He was being um, he was in trouble like they were casting the film in, in this suburban um, high school, like around where I live, Westchester County, and they uh, he wasn't applying. They were getting probably theater kids to like audition. And so he's running around and uh, getting in trouble. And I think he like got caught for like, you know, ditching class and smoking grass in the, in the bathroom. And they just noticed this guy, you know, the, the casting people who's incredibly charismatic, Matt Dillon. Yeah. And he's like, what do you want? I don't know what's going on. And it's like, they didn't trust him. They're like, is this some like gay thing? We're going to shoot this in Soho. You know, I'm, I'm quoting. And so um, a star is born. I mean, like if he didn't happen to cause a ruckus when the casting crew, casting people were there, we would never know Matt Dillon. You know, it's just That's insane. It's incredible. And he's amazing. Was, he's amazing. He's amazing. Oh, amazing. he's great. I, I, uh, I wish that his audition tape was floating around. It sounds hilarious. Like that they're asking him, like, "What is your, what do your parents do?" And he's like, "Ah, oh, my dad's a fucking stockbroker. Yeah. My mom, she don't do shit." You know, like, well, uh, he's a rich, he's a rich kid, <laughs> dirtbag. You know, right. that's where I'm right. From, West Chester. <laughs> like right. half the half the kids, dirtbag kids, were like millionaire sons, you know, and daughters. It's yeah, weird. weird. I it's love also, Matt Dillon. He's such a great streak. In the you know in the eighties, oh, it's you know. fucking awesome! I was, oh, little yeah. darlings. I was just gonna little say, darlings, you're it, so good. Ah, uh, you took yeah. it out of my oh. mouth. I was just gonna say, <laughs> like, there's a great continuation. Uh, I feel like of this character in some ways, you know, um, had he not been shot and killed in this film, is uh, right. in Little Darlings. I mean, he's it's an incredible Absolutely. performance. It's, to me, it's the same guy, basically. It, that's what I'm saying. It's like it's like a had yeah. he lived. It was like the would, summer before. Yeah, uh, you know the, the fall years. when he gets shot with back to school. Right. Yeah, right. Well, so, and another connection too to this type of teen rebel movie, The Outsiders. You know, of course, his performance yeah. is great in that too. Totally. And there, there was an interesting tidbit that connecting that. The, you know, you were mentioning that the uh, the the writers went out and like interviewed all the kids when they were writing the script, and they there was I read an interview where they were talking about how they um, all the kids were reading S. E. Hinton novels. Like that oh, was something wow. that came up again and again. Stay golden, so, Pony Boy. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> I wish well, Matt Dillon had like a a better career rehab. You know, it's like, um, you know, like Bill Murray like lost. And, yeah, well, that's a, that's you're you're he's you're, great. Uh, you're, something about Mary. No, I know, but I wish that you know, I wish that he had like that was yeah, like ninety five or whatever. I wish I want another Matt yeah. Dillon like 
Renaissance. Resurgence. Like, yeah. you know, like uh, fucking, what, what's his name? Just got the whale. I want Matt Dillon to come back. You know? <laughs> the whale. Right. Hey, you know what? It might happen because because he's might. got the goods, man. He's Matt fucking well, he did Dillon. That, he did that. He did that. Um, that Lars von Trier thing, right? For a minute. That was the, the where he's a serial killer. Oh, yeah. Right? I didn't see no, that. That was a long time ago. That's uh, true. Well, so, yeah. so, so anyway, so you got him. Um, you also, side note, I'm maybe going to transition to some of my favorite scenes, kind of jump those off with you guys. Vincent Spano is also premiering in this film, and he's great. And he, one of my favorite scenes in the film is uh, he's another kind of thug who's less hanging. He doesn't hang with Carl, really. In fact, there's antagonism. But Carl uh, sees, when Carl runs away, he sees that the Vincent Spano characters run away like long term uh, and living in a van down by the river, basically, yeah. uh, in a tent in this, like with his dirt bike in the mud. And he's just oh, like dr- dropped out of society. Amazing. And it's such a great small scene where they bond and they kind of just look at each other. And it's like like uh, like wayward youth. And it's just it's just a, a great performance by Spano. There's a making of a star right there. But I just want to say that just what I was saying before about the authenticity of, of having in the background all the real kids, I think another masterstroke of the film is maybe underrepresented in people's appreciation are those quiet scenes like where he meets up with Spano, uh, you know, in the mud. But also all those scenes where they walk in the field, this one opens up to you guys, they walk in the field and it almost looks like a beautiful foreign, like European film. And, and the yeah. music is great. And it's like the sun is setting. It's very melancholy, and it's so barren, so abandoned, and mm-hmm. and just these these figures walking in these lonely landscapes of just nothing and empty houses. So yeah, I, I thought the same. I thought the same when I was watching this. Also, when they're walking through like the neighborhood and stuff, I thought like far part of me was just like if I squint and like change the language, I could imagine this could be a, a foreign film, you know, like yeah. it could be a French film or something, yeah. uh, you know, Varga or something. I mean, the, but Kaplan, the director, like he is like French or English or something, right? Like he's, he's uh, from, he's from England, I, I think. Um, I I, I, yeah, weird tidbit. He was directing um, uh, uh, Who Killed Bambi, the Sex Pistols movie that Roger Ebert wrote. Oh, he was the director. Wow. I thought that was Wes Meyer. He was also involved, but like, I guess Kaplan was involved at one stage of it. You know, it never got made or whatever, right. but, uh, and I know he was like a Corman guy too. So I'm a little fuzzy on the details, but I know both of those things that he was working right. with Corman and then uh, he was involved yeah. with like the Sex Pistols movie. So he does, maybe he brought a little bit of that European sensibility to it. And that's why he seems like, well, no, totally. And that's why I brought that up. Like I, I want to kind of shout out the filmmaking in this, on this yeah. podcast. Let and me- that's what I was doing before. So Kaplan's a very sensitive, really creative guy. I just wanted to keep making those points. Uh, me, and so, yes, Marcus, me, he really, I'm sure, knows all his French New Wave and stuff. The thing about, like, I think that that scene that you brought up earlier, you know, um, about, I think Mark is Spano's character's name, I think. I think it's Mark. Uh, um, I think so. Yeah, I think it's Mark. Uh, so okay. Vincent Spano's character, you know, meets up with Carl. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, with Carl. And, yeah. um it's it's such a great moment too when you see them because obviously they're at odds right from the beginning. I mean, Mark, you know, is kind of uh, like the film opens up with him sort of sniping down at you know cop cars with his BB gun. Incredible to the tune of Cheap Tricks. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. I know, and it's fucking rips. Great way to open a movie. Great way to open a movie. Obviously, we're getting to like a view of this, you know, su- like suburban hellscape with all these new developments, and then we're also seeing that we're also seeing, you know, Vincent Spano's character sniping down at at a cop. And, oh, and his uh, and his Neanderthal uh, long blonde haired friend. Yeah. Shout out yeah. to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Totally. Yeah. Exactly. And then. Uh, Bonk. And then basically Carl, and you sort of see them get the heat, you know, for what yeah. Vincent Spano's characters did to the cops. And of course, you know, that's when they find the switchblade on Richie. And uh huh. How big is this blade, White? Three inches. Almost as big as your dick. <laughs> that's when things start to really escalate. When you start to when when the film introduces yeah. that these cops 
uh, or the authority figures in this town are hell bent on fucking keeping these kids down. And we should say special shout out to the cop who uh, is Doberman. our homeboy, who's our who's our our homeboy from <laughs> Taxi Driver, who's hawking them Errol Finn, uh, our uh, uh, Errol he Flynn. He's so great. Styles. He's great in everything. <laughs> Yeah. He's definitely an MVP character actor, and it's great yeah. to see him here. He shreds as a as a douchebag, kind of like pear shaped, like a redneck a California <laughs> cop. There's there's a very uh, special kind of redneck. It's a California redneck, and he's so that you know. So, anyway, no, totally. Yeah, his name is Harry Northrup. So shout out to you. You know, keep shouts. Arrow Big shots. Subtitles. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. just to put a bow on what you were saying, so that's kind of how we're introduced to this, and then of course Mark beats the shit out of Carl in that amazing moment, which we see after the house party. I mean, I'm bringing up all these amazing scenes, but you see this amazing yeah. Verite house party that's very authentic to what oh. kids in the late 70s, you well, know. Well, again, well just, well, just to stay on that, I think that the filmmakers were being led by the teens. And just to give, uh, yeah. uh, to flesh that out even more, yes, they were, the kids were, the, you know, the uh, unknown kids were cast, non-actors. They picked the music. Like, like wow. they deferred to the kids. Like, yeah, they were like, um, they couldn't pick everything. Like they couldn't, they probably, I think the kids were like, we listen to Led Zeppelin like constantly. No, we so listened to Bob O'Reilly, which they couldn't get. I heard. It was expensive, but <laughs> yeah. they could have gotten it. But, but anyway, my point is like, they would go like, we're into this. We're into Joe Walsh. We're into foreigner. We're into, so they were leading the way. And so they would lead the way about what they said, what they listened to, how they acted. That kid who chews on the beer can. Oh. That was just that just happened <laughs> like and they happened to have their camera fixed on that guy and he just started doing that because yeah. he was basically at a party in his mind and just like <laughs> this is what I do to impress the ladies like, yeah. <laughs> so like it's very yeah. it's very yeah tight. it's by design too I, the, the interview with the Kaplan was talking about how he was really into Frederick Wiseman and like so Ooh. I think that was his like there you go I, right. that was his idea for how to make the film was to set so it up that cool. way. It's almost like it's really cool because it's one of those movies that it doesn't register the first time you watch it like that there's this craft and technique behind exactly. it to how they're getting it you know exactly. and i guess that's what makes it a really good movie because like you, you you don't feel you're not getting hit over the head with the craft you know it just it's just working exactly. so well but it's but the word i would use, i was thinking when i rewatched it everything is so considered you know mm -hmm. and just to, mm -hmm. to, to just put a button on what we were just talking about that great scene which that one always got me. And I talked to my friend Luke, uh, and uh, Cut Chemist is a huge fan. Shout out to him uh, of this film. And uh, we all we both immediately went like, dude, the scene where Carl gets beat up, and the choice to pull out all the the, the OG sound, you know, and to just have that beautiful music done by yeah Jonathan Kaplan's father, Saul Kaplan. And, um, you know, and it's just, it feels, someone described it as the scene is in slow motion, yeah. actually. And I was like, oh, it's, it's not, yeah, <laughs> but I know. it feels it's, like it. Because yeah, of the, yeah. Isn't it weird? Wow. Because of that choice. That's cool. And, and, they, and the thing is, that's the thing. Jonathan Kaplan said in the commentary, it's like, the, you know, the incidental sound was there, like the punching and the ooh-ah and all that. And they went, let's just lose it. And those are the kind of small considered choices that show real artistry. And that's where the real respect for Kaplan has to happen. Like, it, there's so much intention on a subtle level, Mark, it's just like you were saying, it's not like screaming at you, no. except, you know, maybe this is a big lyrical moment, the beat up in, in the part in the playground. But um, but uh, but throughout the whole film, it's considered. Yeah, it's it's definitely setting the bar, you know, for these coming of age films and like how you should approach the material. It's really fucking smart. Great, smart choices, one after the other. And exactly. so um, just to kind of bring it all back around. This you know amazing you know scene where you know uh, Vincent Spano beats up uh, Carl the main character, and and then of course after that you know we're seeing this onslaught of our of our cop you know our main cop character the main villain of the film you know he's sort of the warden of this town I mean this guy is r keeping everybody down and I think a major theme of this movie is really exploring like man like um, trying to control what you you know shouldn't. You know, trying to overly control, you know, what you shouldn't. And it's going to and, and the more you push back, the more it's going to push back on you. And that's Low the back, generational yeah. thing. Right. Um, but so it's so great to see in that scene you were talking about, about when Spano and Carl get on the same page, 
is so yeah. fucking great when you see they're like yeah what's up what's up let's you know right like that's the best and yeah. and of course like and and it, i don't know it's just it's it's amazing just going full circle from you know how they're you know adversarial to being on the same page right. based upon the impression well, like Car- that they're both carl having. carl greets him and says hello by shooting him with a bb gun yes <laughs> you know? exactly which is <laughs> like too know. real no, and, too then, real. and then spano's character just goes like you know touche are we yeah even? nice you know. shot we're even oh, totally. yeah it's like a, i think what you're i think what you're saying evan <laughs> i think what you're saying evan something about that scene that really sticks with me is like it's an understanding it's like kid kid uh yeah kid speak you know like yeah. like teen teen uh simpatico and kid yeah. you know like you know and it's just yeah. and it's not yeah. overplayed at all it's not overarched like in a kind of campy movie like a rebel without a cause you know like kind of the classic mid-century like dramaturgy you know it's like very a lot of naturalism is what i'm trying to say even yeah. in these small two character scenes mm-hmm. just great and it's all shot really well um yeah. oh, so God. Sorry, this is the right. We are jumping all over the place in this one, but just one more reference that popped in that when I was researching stuff was that he was, you know, that naturalism that you're talking about. The uh, another film that he was super inspired by when he's when he sat to make this film was Superfly. He was really no, inspired no, by, like, yeah, yeah. And I, I love that. that. This guy is our director. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah. Team Captain yeah. all day. Team, team Captain. But, um, um, but. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it's, like, so uh, it's just it's just a beautiful moment with you know Mark and Carl that they they team up because they really also I think realize that they're being pitted against each other by the powers that be. That's what I was trying to say is that they're yeah, they're on okay. the level because you know they're, they're 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 starting to get hip to what's actually happening. You know, yeah, and that of course is um, and then real quick well, they take you know, action <laughs> they, yeah they take fucking serious action for you know an incredible last act of the movie there but w- one thing i do just want to say to just to put a last final bow on the real estate end of things too is this all like a, a total button gets put on all of this when you see in that moment when there's the guy who's giving the speech in front of everybody at school you know while the kids are locking up all the you know surrounding areas so they can't get out in the school and that the rec room is closed for the day. Yeah. 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 And then there's that like community leader who gets up and says is that a community with a juvenile crime problem is not a community with a high property resale value. I am interested the in the health of this community. The, yeah. That's the that's like the main <laughs> you know, that's what the movie is right fucking there. And it got me thinking like these kids who are like trapped in this like weird like you know, globe, like closed in shell society. It's like, it almost does feel like it's um, an experimental society. I was know? just going to say that. No, it's, it feels, yeah. it feels to me like an experimental society, like akin to like, dare I say like a JG Ballard sort of story, like a, like a high rise or like, you know, something like that where it's yeah. like some oh, sort of quasi science fiction experimental. Well, that's society. it. It's all a very, in the mid mid century is, is a lot of social engineering going on. Yeah. And that goes all the way to Nazism, <laughs> to uh, Marxism. Right. You know what I mean? Like social engineering is this weird thing that does trickle down into these kind of strange, bad ideas of having like the perfect town because like uh, or communities aren't organically rising naturally from like, you know, commerce and then like the workers who come for the commerce, you know, like, like, you know, all these cities start from sea, you know, seaport areas. You know, so what I'm saying is there's an organic rise to communities and cultures, but in this place, it's like, it's, it's like a microwave culture and society, you know, it's just like, uh, all right, let's just give it 90 days. And then suddenly, you know, like we're going to have everything and, uh, and everything will be fine because we've, um, thought about it and we've angled it perfectly. So it's like impossible for it to fail because we've like mapped it mapped out how society a society is going to mm-hmm. work in microcosm and it's like it doesn't work that way but people right. really got into social engineering in the 20th it's, century i think it's kind of out of favor now yeah right well there's still so much of this happening where they they build a they don't build like neighborhood grids the way that they used to like right like with a a town a, like a city hall in the center of town and like a a town square and then like yeah. a, a tiny little cute downtown area and then all right. the houses and neighborhoods are on a grid that bleed out from that. No, they don't do that anymore. They build like these box stores on the side of the highway uh, where yeah. everybody like uh, the people that work at those box stores live in like some uh, uh, condominiums like sort of behind there, apartment buildings behind there. Like, like and, the people that shop, and the people that shop in those 
you know, box stores live in these like a zoned, you know, like developments that are like next yeah. to a golf course right. or whatever, you know, right. like they still are doing this and like still happening. It's like all of America is basically becoming new Granada, you know, in a way it's like everything is just still, I think everything is still going that way. Yes. Like a lot of people did come back to the cities and they built all these condos going up, but I still, every time I go to a place, a, a smaller town, like I see, I see like the Walmarts coming in that didn't used to be there and the developments cruising yeah. in everywhere, you know, Box store especially town. like in where I'm from in Montana, I see that happen a lot. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I don't so, have a yeah, lot I mean, of personal experience sort of, with that. Yeah. I mean, I guess the East coast was sort of like so developed, you know, before like that saying, trend, yeah. you know, right. and like, and the West is still just got all this open room where they're like, like you said, there used to be, a, maybe there's a gravel pit that now is like a Walmart parking lot or something, you know, so really it's really gross. Like, yeah. yeah, it's just it's, inorg- it's just inorganic, and it doesn't consider like n- not just like children's feelings and and and, and emotions, but um, the adults even, you know. So uh, like, I don't think the adults are happy in New Granada either, you know. <laughs> not really. No, no, doesn't and, seem like it. No, and 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 it's also interesting too because it's like this this weird dissertation I read too was talking about how the movie uh, he was comparing the movie to also like a western like a classic western you know in, in terms of because like you know <laughs> westerns westerns are like you know uh, like you know community like conflict at the yeah. center of a western is like territory and you know tribal conflicts and and how the yeah, and yeah. how the and, and how the kids represent more of the <laughs> wild west and the boomer parents are more of the colonizers you know and there's right. the, corrupt, the, of, the corrupt lawman the corrupt sheriff yep. you know? yeah Absolutely. yeah right yeah. so it's wow. kind of this, like Read cool that. yeah which i think is a cool take on you know what the movie is so i don't know just kind of interesting but um i i think i know where you want to go because i know we want to talk about more of these great lyrical moments in the movie and I'm going to tie it all I together. do, yeah. I, I know one yeah. on the tip of your tongue because it was one of mine too, which um, I think also speaks to the theme of real estate. And it's kind of visually shown yeah. in this scene, which is amazing, is that all the kids kind of hang out. Once the rec center is closed, they kind of hang out or they also hang out at a sort of unfinished, half-finished, one of these incredible. half-finished model homes, which is amazing choice. Yeah. <laughs> and it's 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 incredible. Brilliant. Another, yeah, brilliant choice for the film because it plays into the themes and it adds more to the authenticity. Yeah. But it's a visual um, re- metaphor. Yeah. It's you funny. know, like when yeah. you're, you know, it's like you see them in this. They're playing house. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really really incredible. And of course, there's this great relationship that sparks between you know the main character Carl and oh my god, I'm forgetting her name. Uh, well, the actress is Pamela Ludwig, right? And uh, I, I don't remember her name. <laughs> the, the <laughs> yeah. Character, right? Exactly. The character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she, she. Oh, well. uh, but they, they have this great moment that does remind me of another one fucking hour classic. Uh, uh, um, Welcome to the Dollhouse. A little bit. They kind of share that kind of moment. Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, but yes. in verse a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah, you. and and they kind of share this great moment, and they 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 you know Carl and her spend the night together, and then. And then they wake up, and it's these beautiful shots framed of like a dawn. Incredible, of both of them. And and, and and you know, there was a yeah. fire in the hills, and that's why there's these these huge plumes of smoke when when he watches her walk away. Oh, wow. oh awesome! Yeah, it looks. It's incredible. just it's just for, you know fortuitous uh, that that happened. You know, he was just yeah. lucky. But um, actually, like uh, yeah, so scene too, actually, it, no, totally. Well, it like is it, the yeah. West, you know, like the landscape, like, Colorado, like the, like the shack. You know that the hero has to, yeah. you know, kind of. You know, get get all healed up in before he goes. He's got to get on his horse and leave in the morning. You like know, wreck to like and, burn and, and, and meet up down. with <laughs> and meet up with Spano, yeah. who's you know with his horse, you know, yeah. down by the river. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> it's, it? I got to kind of stew on that, yeah. but I just want to. I think maybe we should flesh out some of the people in the film. Like, sure. um, there's our leads, you know, and there's this great uh, that that kind of big bone gal who hangs out with them. It yeah. was really into like, yeah, let's let's shoot the gun. You know, she's great. That is not an actress. <laughs> she just went to the high school where they shot it. And Amazing. she's great. And the thing is, what I'm saying is I think she rose to the occasion and they thought she could we could give her some dialogue and some exchanges with our real actors, you know, love her. Then let's not forget the MVP maybe of the night who's um, the kid who's mute. Uh, uh, I forgot his name. That yeah. is his brother. Claude's brother. Claude's brother. An incredible visual rendering. New wave sunglasses, little skateboard, long hair, mute. But the scene, I just want, I'm just going to keep talking about lyrical scenes. This one kills me. That look. Exactly. But here's what kills me is uh, A, 
uh, Carl, Paul, Carl calls him from running away and just checks in, like, is Richie dead? Is he alive, you know? And, and of course, this kid is um, he's mute, right? So he has to just do, like, tap once for yes, tap no for, you know, tap once for no or whatever. And so, um, but, of course, the, the little uh, mute kid is watching our favorite thing, which is an Atari <laughs> video music player, which is the insane, uh, like, abstract like uh, Navajo blanket patterns yeah. that are playing that he's watching. When the phone rings, he's like, you know, I'm watching TV, which is like repeating pulsations <laughs> of color. Yeah. Like video yeah, synthesis. Like, like, yeah, screen. like that's how, and the implication is like, this guy is deeply stoned and he's like 12. Yeah. It's incredible, but it's also haunting. So that's that's a great detail that they, that they it, I'm sure Jonathan Kaplan was like, Yes, that is what <laughs> that little kid's doing when he the phone rings. But also, it's very haunting, and it's played very well. The music's great. When he does do the tap, the very consequential tap, which I, I think is no is uh, or I don't remember. Yes is yes is one tap. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, is Richie dead? Is what Carl asked the the mute kid, and he just goes tap. You yeah. know, and I mean that's that's filmmaking, man. Yeah, you know, it's great. It's that's nighttime great. and a phone booth for Carl. Mm -hmm. The alienation. The film is a huge bummer, you yeah. know. And and I really and it's I don't know if it's like ahead of its time, but like this is only 1979, and, and dealing with teenagers and they didn't do this. They didn't do these things. There was no there's no Animal House comic relief. Really. No, that's what I'm saying. You know, mm -hmm. like like uh, there's no like or like uh, like the cheerleaders or you know like. Um, they put saltpeter in the in the chili in the height in the cafeteria you know all the stupid movies but there was another movie actually there was another movie when i was a kid that was constantly and it was called hots h-o-t-s oh, yeah. yeah right and i watched that one every day that was it was either over the edge or hots when i was a kid on cable but uh, oh and also here's my weekly obligatory danny bonaducci shout out uh hots seek out hots 1979 starring Danny Bonaduce is singing like musical numbers. It's good mm. shit. So well, what I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, that was normal. Hots, where over the edge is just like weird and sour and and mm -hmm. beautiful and like a foreign film. So Warner Brothers was like, no, I don't yeah, it's ahead this. of its time. Yeah. I think. I think it was ahead of its time, and I think that um, mm -hmm. I think that probably had something to do with the you know wrong wrong place, wrong time kind of thing. You know, for it because. Yeah. Yeah, it's but it, it's been rediscovered and um. But if I could quickly shout out my, I, I know we touched on him a little bit, but I want to give him a little more time. Is is Claude? Do it. You know, oh, Claude, Claude, dude. <laughs> um, Claude really is incredible in this movie, and I think just another oh, amazing, you know, real life sort of authentic moment in this movie that seems like it must have just you know been based on a true story is, you know, him dropping acid at school. It's supposed to be speed, but I think it was acid. Flash. Really? Feels so. I took uh, speed, but I think it's acid, man. I'm yeah. flash. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, and of course, what's today's lesson? The paintings of Hieronymus Bosch. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God. No, it's Bosch amazing. Acid, yeah. But he, he plays that he plays that so well. But I mean, like, I feel like you wouldn't see a scene like that in any other Hollywood film because I don't think even Hollywood no. filmmakers no. are even aware that a kid his age <laughs> are, are is taking acid yeah. at school at that yeah. age. Yeah. They wouldn't and, believe and it, it. And of course, it wouldn't be a, if they did it today. It wouldn't be done as well because they would immediately kick in Jefferson Airplane, you know, and then the, the camera would start to dutch and you'd start to zoom in yeah. on his eyeball as his as his like uh, you know pupils getting bigger and then you know right uh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I thought, this is a documentary that, that sweaty fear that he's seeing in his yeah. eyes. I swear that is the same look <laughs> that yeah. the kid that I knew that took acid at school <laughs> yeah. you know, like, came up to oh, yeah, me and was like. This. I'm on acid, you know. I was yeah. like, okay, look out, uh, <laughs> go like really me. rolling, really <laughs> rolling, really and, rolling. And yeah, and it, yeah. What's and there's almost <laughs> there is a comical element to it because he's doing really bad with the with the Hieronymus Bosch slideshow. But then it's like, <laughs> meanwhile, an hour later, they're at the assembly watching the vandalism 16 millimeter educational film, and it's like Carl's doing even worse. He's like, oh, and then he, yeah. and of course the classic line, Carl is like, sorry, Claude, Claude is saying. Like so destructive, oh, because in the yeah. 16 millimeter, 
<laughs> the 16 millimeter educational film they're like don't do this kids and they're like breaking windows and things and yeah. so destroyed dude that is maybe my favorite moment in i know life. me too dude, dude I, I i'm think telling it is. you it is that's that's a director and a team working on another fucking team claude. level and you know what's yeah, funny you know what's funny actually I, I got i got definitive word that uh because i wasn't sure because claude is i guess the actor is such a good actor well, my point, what I'm trying to say is Claude was an actor. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, he, I thought maybe like the kind of the big bone gal was just pulled out of the uh, the background of the of the actual kids. No, he was an actor and he's really good. And I think that he does sell naturalism really well. Like when he's like talking mm-hmm. about like, yeah, man, like, uh, can I get another lid of hash off you? And like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. hey, tip. Hey, Claude. How's it going? Pretty good. Just getting mellow, man. Got some hash. Excellent. How much? Like that feels like that a documentary, but that guy's an actor. I got my little. I got <laughs> stuffed my peppers. Tea. Stuffed peppers tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we can't miss <laughs> that shit. <laughs> stuffed peppers tonight. We don't want to miss that, do we, Johnny? We can't miss oh, that. Oh boy. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. His, his line <laughs> readings are. His line readings are fucking on point. But dude, my little anecdote on Claude though yeah. is um, the first time I saw a Sonic Youth album. So okay, I'm obsessed with this movie, and then like two years later, I'm in New York City and I'm I get uh, I'm looking at Bad Moon Rising, and I look at the back of the cover and I go, "That's Claude. That is Claude." <laughs> and I went like for two seconds, I went, "Oh my god, the actor is in a band now." Yeah. Or okay, he is. A, yeah, and it's it's Thurston Moore. So. Yeah. That was my connection. Um, Thurston Moore looks on. exactly like Claude, and I, you know, I'm right. I'm, 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 I'm seeing Claude here. Uh, I'm looking him up uh, on his, you know, IMDb. I think this is his he's only in, film role. Yeah, he's now an Damn. entertainment lawyer, is what uh, the commentary <laughs> really? said. Oh, wow. tiny, yeah, I know. Is that funny? No, he's totally together. You know, like because uh, I thought he was like he died in 1984. You yeah, know, like, exactly. Yeah, Bills. Totally. I know, right? It's Claude. <laughs> yeah, totally. One little tiny Claude thing, just to geek out hard is so claude there's the riot which we should probably close the show with talk about the riot but maybe we this is gets into it i love like you're like hey what's claude been up to you know like let's let's check in with claude during the riot hey claude what have you been doing during the riot oh i've been collecting every single headphone in the (laughs) av class like the english you know (laughs) like like the foreign language class and i put every single headphone dozens of them all over my body yeah, that's you guys know so, what I'm saying. Yeah, when he, did yeah, you catch when he, that? When he's suiting up for the battle, I, I, that seemed like his battle. Is that what he's doing? I don't know. It kind of like that's his how armor. I that's how I read his it. His armor. Like, I think he's, he's just still like, tripping, right? He's not still tripping, right? Yeah. Who, who knows with, with Claude? Yeah. So okay, well the riot. Do you guys want to get into that? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. Uh, think, yeah, I can start I, off. It took a couple days. That's all I'm gonna say, and then go, you guys go for it. Um, it took a couple days. It was a big. It was a big shoot, and they had problems because the kids could only work a certain amount of time. So they like it was very. It was very difficult for a lot of reasons. But I'll just say this: um, the first night of shooting the riot part, uh, Keith Moon dies. Like oh. the word got out on like rock radio, <laughs> and all the kids were very affected by that. They were really shook and stung, man. They're like Keith Moon, man. I can't believe it. So they were dealing with. They were processing that. That's During right. Riot, but it, of course, he's enjoyed, an icon of destruction too. Yes, you know? I mean, of course. Of course. Right. Enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the riot scene in the in, in the film is the kind of penultimate, you know, set piece there, and it's it's so yeah. amazing how. Um, it's great because like there, there's obviously the tension of it building. You see them chaining everybody in. Um, More great and, filmmaking. Yeah, it's great filmmaking, and then of, of, course, of, of the slight lead up. Yes. Like, like you see the kids in the in the background and and the and the boring speakers talking, and yeah. they're like giving the finger. Like it's slow escalation. Like yeah. it's almost like the sharks are starting to swim closer to the boat. You know, like mm-hmm. the brilliant. Film. Yeah, it just I, ratches up the tension. It's so right. Yeah, Marcus. Yes. Right. Oh, just I, you know, one thing I think it's so impressive about the riot is that it it the feeling that it generates in the audience. Like there's a catharsis there. It feels good to watch them destroy those things. And the fact that you can do that, you know, show this all this destruction and have that effect on the audience where they're sort of elated and like you're excited and you're kind of swept up in the moment and just it feels good. It feels like you're out there smashing all this stuff. And I don't that that's I think that's an amazing um 
you know, that just shows, again, like top notch filmmaking. If you can uh, set know, up to elicit mean. that from the audience and you're successful, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's not just like horrifying. It could, you know, right. it could be played lots right. of, it could be the effect it has on you could happen right. lots of ways. It could be scary. It could be like horrifying. You could be like, oh my God, like, like feel dangerous. But the, I well, think with this, it feels like it yeah. feels well, good the filmmaker, to watch them strike back. You know? I know exactly what you're saying. I think Kaplan wanted to infuse uh, the true feelings of the kids, which is not, it's like, there's no way you're not identifying with the parents really in this I, whole I was film, you know, just going to say that. Yeah. So yeah, Cause, yeah the, the, the whole thing, which that's, what's kind of brilliant about this movie in a lot of ways is that, and that's probably why the studio didn't get it, you know, is because they're probably on the side of juvenile delinquency is a problem, you know? And I think what's so cool about this movie is that it really endears you so much to the kids, you know, um, for obviously throughout the whole entire film and it's from their perspective and it's really about yeah fuck these adults fuck these boomer assholes right. who've created this artificial are there, are there any there's one sympathetic adult uh, the girl who runs the uh, rec oh center. yeah no of course yeah there's yeah, only her, one yeah no the parents her. suck yeah, everyone sucks in the movie, but I mean, it's it's really like this oppressive world that they're having to live in. I mean, they're constantly living under a microscope. Everything they do is like magnified. They're being harassed and abused like constantly until they're pushed, you know, over the edge, over the edge. Um, and hey, over it's, the edge. Hello. I didn't even mean to say that. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, it's it's just, it's it's so great how the movie, any movie, any type of revenge film or any type of movie like that where you really can get behind that moment and you're like yeah. cheering them on yeah. and like, fuck yeah, mm -hmm. so great. And then, of course, tension and release, movies, tension and release. But then also to see all of that footage being captured so well in like, you know, handheld, amazing doc, doc style, you know, it's, can, can I give you one tidbit? Oh. Just just like like my running theme here is just like the Brava filmmaking. Yeah. Kaplan realized that he wanted to have. How can I put this? Um, some kind of a visual anchor uh, for the riots, like something like a, a large some thing that your mind can um, keep pinging to, and he picked the huge white tuba. You know, yeah, what I was yeah. wondering about. I was I was wondering why that kid is running because you see it. It was when you see it later, and the police car is chasing them, and you see that kid still carrying the tuba. I was really wondering why is he still doing that. that that's a great um, could be a weird little gag tidbit. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, no, but I'm saying Kaplan had intention. He's like he wanted to. Um, yeah, he. I think he didn't want to have um, it to just be a big mu messy mush, and he wanted to have like at least one thing that like is really has a sharp ping, visual ping, because otherwise it is kind of like a mess, like just like kids' bodies and like like broken things. And he wanted mm -hmm. to just have some kind of little uh, like a like a painter's brush touch huh. uh, that keeps reoccurring uh, every now and then in the milieu of the right. general chaotic. <laughs> I you love know what that. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Great filmmaking. Um, absolutely. What, what, one thing too, about the riot, just observation real quick. Cause you know, I love plugging our other episodes. I mean, I'm here to plug our other episodes. Hell but yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the ending, you know, to me, the chaos of the ending felt a lot like not only one of our other episodes, but another 1979 film, um, oh, a lot. Was it, it? It has some Dawn of the Dead energy, you know. Which yeah! Was, wow, I never thought of that. You know, you're and, so and it's, right. And guess what? It's another Holy film. Shit. It's another film about uh, fucking materialistic comfort and sequestering yourself in yeah. that, and then oh, it, and, it, well, and, shitty suburbs. Yeah, same dead, dead themes, dead, dead, dead in suburbs. A critique yeah. of capitalist society. Yeah. Yeah. Wow! So. Double feature. Yeah. Death. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Can I? Jesus. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well. Just well, just backtracking. Remember when I did say that Warner Brothers wanted to that we're trying to market this as a horror film to people. So there maybe that's what Warner Brothers saw. Like, uh, maybe. like, like what I'm saying is like four four millionaire executives with like three kids each are watching this, and that riot scene is not going down like Marcus said. You know, like uh, the cathartic and like identification. It's like. To them, that's like a Dawn of the Dead scene. <laughs> yeah, you know right. I mean? right. Right. It's, it right. is. It is. Yeah. Exa that's what I'm saying. Uh -huh. Oh, this is a horror movie. These kids are attacking us. Right. That's, what, that's how like, they're seeing like it. Like Warner Brothers is like, of course we're marketing this like a horror movie. Aren't you it's seeing a horror this movie. horror movie? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's 100%. Wow. Um, Sick. <laughs> There you right. go. Yeah. Coming out of we the '60s it. too, where like the youth, the youth generation was like a threat for like uh, to society for like a brief moment in time, right? For like six months, people were like afraid that the the youth culture was going to like yeah. oh, take yeah. American society out in the streets, like you said earlier. Right, right.
And that's where all right. this was heading. I mean, into the 80s. I mean, war on drugs, war on youth, you know, th- yeah, that was going to be I'm glad you're bringing that up. Like, like this movie set the tone for where we were about to go into the 80s, I feel like, in a lot of different <laughs> ways, you know, with society and with culture and, and film and everything. I think it's really ahead of its time. In a well, lot yeah. Hey, guys. It's interesting, like, just noting about the, 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 um, the John Hughes thing, when you were bringing that up, I was just noting that those kids aren't rebellious. You know, they are, like, they might party too much or whatever, but they are... Dude, uh, you know they're preppy kids. They're living in society, like more or less behaving by the rules. Yeah, they might dress funny occasionally, you know, but they're, they're just having fun. Yeah, here. they're just they're having fun, and that that is the eighties. It's like don't rock this the is boat. Before, right? This is before the slacker generation. <laughs> this is before the slacker generation where kids. You mean like were, Kurt Cobain? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, this is where like these there kids have go. a call, they have something to they have something to fight for. Like the, they they have a purpose yeah. and they're going to fight for it and they're going to get it. And that's very different. Well, the, you know, you know what it is. What Here's a good word for for this they're bored but they're also dissatisfied and they feel like they've gotten like uh, the short end of the stick it's like what is this bullshit in this adult life you know but they're dissatisfied and they're and they're pushing back against it you know but ironically they're not apathetic like tim hunter's yeah. the the you know the next film you know river's edge where that's all about uh, yeah. apathy and yeah you know <clears throat> nihilistic, connection, nihilistic I, you know, yeah. I guess the breakfast club does rebel a little bit Right, there's a little bit of that, but they're not. Um... Well, well, they're represented <laughs> partly, you know, like a, one of the many people, the jocks. Just right? one, just Judd or whatever. Right. The, yeah, token. Yeah, guys, we're running out of time, and let's talk about the very end of the film. This is actually a very big deal. So, the film ends as we all see it with the song "Ooh Child." Things are going to get a little mm-hmm. easier. I've wondered for a long. Well, I saw a, a screening of this years ago with the director, and he did. T- uh, my mind was blown, and he said, "You know, this is cut." to Baba O'Reilly by The Who, you know, Teenage Wasteland. <laughs> he said it was cut that way. And someone on YouTube, by the way, everybody check it out, oh, put cool. Baba O'Reilly and the cuts and the cuts do line up kind of. Oh, sweet. Now, the thing oh, is, sweet. there's been a lot of back and forth in the lore of like why Baba O'Reilly was not used and Oh Child was used. There's a practical reason. Uh, Bob O'Reilly was really expensive, and yeah. Ooh Child was peanuts to, to, for them to use. You know, you know it's weird that the, the Jimi Hendrix is used. You know, by the way, because that was a real, that's he's really rare to turn up in movies too. Just as a aside. Well, that's but. Uh, that was Mom Rock for uh, you know Matt Dillon's mother. You know, what's this old shit on eight track? You remember? Yeah, it's amazing. That's context, yeah. but guys, we're running out of time. So <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that there was the consideration that Bob O'Reilly was too expensive, but also. I, the filmmakers themselves, not Warner Brothers, said this is ending so downbeat. They're all wasted, wasted, teenage wasteland. And they said, ooh, child, because uh, the producer, I think, brought it to Kaplan and said, let's maybe end on a slightly more uh, uh, optimistic note. Optimistic. And, and they said this song. So so I always thought the intention, I'm sorry, I always thought that it was um, – Teenage Wasteland, they just couldn't do it because of a money thing. But they actually did make an aesthetic decision to decide to land hmm. on a more and open... And doesn't Carl, office. like, even but, though Carl's boarding that juvenile bus or whatever, like, doesn't he still have a sense of, like, like the, the look on his face is like... I'll be fine. You know, I'll be fine, which is great. So it does kind of work, you know, with that in, in some ways, right, which I do right. like. Yeah. I mean, it would have been cool for that Bob O'Reilly drop there. It's on YouTube. I, and I, it, I do it, prefer it does the... Uh, pack a punch. I'll, I'll I do put prefer it the, the five stair steps version of uh, Ooh Child, yeah. but yeah. the Valerie Carter one has gr- grown on me. I guess yeah. I just <laughs> I, I've I've gone back and forth on the ending, but um, Ooh Child, knowing the intention of the filmmakers that they wanted to end on a a more optimistic note, uh, I respect that and I like that because it would have been a real crushing. It's like a German downer film if yeah. you end with "They're all wasted." You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. With <laughs> um, so the last ten seconds, my uh, anecdote of the when the because you, you brought up the Jimi Hendrix thing, riding around with Matt Dillon listening to Jimi Hendrix, I think hints at what it would have been like to hang out with Cliff Burton at that same age. So. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> right. yeah, nice one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bam. Great that film. Was it. Great, great to talk, guys. Uh, really fun. Uh, what a movie. We just love that movie a lot. There's a lot to say about that. I mean, one hour is tough on that one. Um, yeah. But uh, definitely, yeah. hopefully, you've seen the film. Um, and you, or if not, definitely go out of your way to check it out. It's on uh, Apple. I think you can get it on your Apple TV there. I just watched okay. it that way. So it's, it's, it's available. It's, it's yeah. really rewarding stuff. Like, not yeah. just the, the subject matter. And all the kind of like the the tropes of like you know the 
the cultural thing and the seventiesness and cool t shirts. Yeah. <laughs> it's just right. It's just the fucking filmmaking, you know? Yeah, we didn't we didn't talk about the fucking style in in this movie, the the amazing yeah. clothes. God damn it. Barely but, touched uh, on the music, you know. I know. Yeah. Barely. Yeah, well, should, well, should we make our announcement then, Evan? Well, yeah, we are, because I think that, that gives us a little cheat to talk about the music. So we well, do have another little surprise for you guys um, in relation to this film. Also going to drop a link for it right now. Probably will pop up on your screen as a bonus little uh, playlist ding. that uh, we're going to put together for you guys. We haven't done a playlist in a minute. We did one for Streetwise, uh, Streetwise and Phantasm. We did, we did a playlist for Phantasm. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Which is dope that we did that. I love so, that one. I love anyway. when we put playlists together based around movies. Yeah. So that's, we should get into the habit of that. So, Tom, yeah. tell us a little bit about the songs inspired by Over the Edge. I don't know. Well, okay, so there is a soundtrack on vinyl, and it's dope, and it's pretty mm-hmm. much all the big monster songs from the movie. Uh, Ramones, uh, Teenage Lobotomy comes in so fucking hard, you know, in the movie. It does. Uh, mm-hmm. With the ACDC poster. Um, yeah, so all the big songs in the movie, like, you really Cheap got... Trick. Me. Oh, of course. Cheap Trick, Surrender, when they're playing with the gun. So all the iconic songs in the film are on an old vinyl soundtrack, and it's fucking dope as hell. But I don't know. I was thinking about um 1979 and the music these kind of kids would be listening to and then maybe like they're 15 and 16 and it's 1980 1981 maybe step 92 i don't know i got a little sprung on that idea and um it's basically radio rock it's what you'd hear on the radio there's no like strange proto this or that or like deep no. cuts yeah it's just like uh it might have abacab on it by genesis you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah. <laughs> because can i can i say one more thing People also do peg this film a lot as like, oh, it's all these metalheads in the, in the smoking section in the back of the school. It's actually tonally the kids are, are a little different. Like, like there's kind of like I said, there's a new wave look that the, the yeah. new kid has, and like um, they're, they're just like BG's you know, BG's t-shirts and Aerosmith t-shirts, right? And, and Jefferson you know. Starship shirts. So I guess what I'm saying is, it's not really the way I'm envisioning it is we're not going to make a playlist that's just like Motorhead and like metal. No. It's like yeah. It's actually like, it's it's sort of part of it is when uh, um, synthesizers meet hard rock, like the cars in the film. The cars are in the film too, so I kind of wanted to play with that because that was a big sound um, in that period where it was uh, power pop, Journey. meets hard rock guitars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. There's a little bit you of know? that crossover, like '70s rock, new wave thing, like Cheap Trick. You know, is, Cheap, yeah, and the exactly. Cars are both yeah, those perfect. bands that like yeah. people will get confused whether or not they were like a new wave band or a uh, yeah. or a classic rock band. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like then you get into things like Lover Boy. You know, Lover Boy. Yeah. yeah. And I know you guys. <laughs> and, and oh, and the last thing I'll say is my main inspiration when I was making my submissions for this playlist is yeah. uh, the last act of Boogie Nights, actually. Yeah, you Sister know? Christian, right? Right? Is that what just you Just that kind of cr- – yeah, well, <laughs> that Butter just like – No, even just tonally the way the – you know, it's like burnout, cocaine, bad hair. The haircuts are getting bad now. The clothes are kind of like <laughs> like, like, yeah. like, fugly looking, you know. Okay. Like, uh, so, that's my thought. Well, everybody, ch- <laughs> check out our songs inspired by Over the Edge uh, playlist mm-hmm. that uh, should have popped up on your screen or will be in the and, description. Uh, oh, just shit. just want to show this off. A, uh, a press book. From Japan, of over the edge. Wow, good stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe we can talk about. Uh, well, we'll do the moment in a minute, right? Yeah. Well, do, do you want to set up the moment, or do you want to let the moment rip? Just a little bit. Um, we're uh, we're laying on you guys a very rare uh, thing. It's the original over the edge trailer. Wow. Like I kept blabbing about that Warner Brothers were trying to say it's a horror movie, and it's fucking cool and cool. so wrong. And wow. I just think it looks like the brood or something. It, it looks like all the kids are, are or it looks like um, uh, I Love It Loud video by Kiss, actually. Ah. It's just like that with glowing eyed ne'er do well teenagers in the suburbs who are going to um, kill your cat and uh, drive your car into a telephone pole. Yeah, it's <laughs> funny that you mentioned that because I was the poster is is like that too. You know, that's the, what the, OG the poster for the, the movie OG poster has that is, vibe. Um, the same graphic is uh, fuels this incredible. Yeah, it's like scary kids. You know? like, yeah. So we'll show you the trailer. Horror, yeah. It's wow. a real treat because I couldn't find it on YouTube or anything, but yeah. I do actually have it. So and shout out to sh- and, and and shout out to kids too because you know this movie <laughs> yeah. too is very 
there's a lot of Kiss aesthetic going on with these. These are a lot of Kiss fan kids, and I think it perfectly captures yeah. that. And they're talking so, about them. Yeah, yeah. that's I right. It. And I love it. And I, when I saw Love It Loud, well, I don't know what order it was in, but uh, when I saw Over the Edge, I thought it, the first thing I thought of was the Love It Loud video. Actually, wow, amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> So, all right, check all that shit out. We're going to get to our moment in just a minute, but let's talk about next week, um, episode 49. Uh, okay, so listen up. Uh, next week, obviously, is Thanksgiving, or actually this week as you're watching it, uh, this week as this episode is landing. We're heading into Thanksgiving, so our schedule is going to be a little up in the air right now in terms of when we'll be able to all record and our schedules will align during given the holiday. But we're going to announce we're going to announce what our next title is uh right now and so it, it'll drop when it drops but here's what it is i'm very excited about this we're gonna have a brand new special guest on the show first time or on the show oh yeah and uh he's one of our favorite filmmakers is he not tom i mean sure and yeah. a friend you he's know a filmmaker and a friend we're very excited uh we are going to be joined uh by uh his name is buddy g or aka buddy giovanazzo uh he is a good friend of mine he directed the film combat shock back in the day in 1986 or 1984 maybe he filmed it in we should do that mm. film as a one fucking hour at some point sure. um <clears throat> but so buddy g is going to be showing up on one fucking hour to talk about maybe awesome. the ultimate thanksgiving film um we have real feast a real feast <laughs> yeah a real feast uh definitely we're gonna be i can't believe we're doing this but i'm really looking forward to it i guess we're doing it it's a little bit of a stunt <laughs> stunt film here for thanksgiving but i'm very excited there's a fascinating history with this movie it's a crazy oh, yeah. movie and there's a lot oh, to talk yeah. about so here we go oh yeah we're going to be doing nine a 1975 pierre Pas paolo pasolini film salo or the 120 days of sodom uh, yay happy thanksgiving <laughs> You can skip yeah. watching that one, Mom. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, Mom, yeah. Dad, don't watch that. One, it's uh, <laughs> it's it's a big deal. It was um, a seismically controversial film then, and it's yeah. still controversial. Oh, my it's a God. it's a wild yeah. film, and and you're right. The whole surrounding history of it, it and including the murder of, I mean, indirectly the murder of Pasolini before we yeah. played Peters. And, yeah. yeah, let's get into so, it. So there is a lot to talk about with this movie, but yes. Be advised if you if if you kind of go in blind in the movies <laughs> that we recommend, you know, going into the next week. If if you haven't seen Salo, do a little bit of reading on it first before you take the plunge into the movie, just so you it's know. Really harsh. Kinda, just so you <laughs> Don't know. Watch it on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> Don't watch it on the in public. <laughs> yeah, not safe for work either. Um, so, not safe for anywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just know what you're getting into before you kind of take the yeah. blind faith yeah. leap with that movie. But anyway, I can't yeah, it's believe it's a bad trip. I'm so glad to be able to say the sentence one fucking hour on Salo or the 120 days of Sodom is next. <laughs> I week. knew we'd get to it at some point, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it'd be, it'd be great to have I, buddy G too. Just, you know, yeah. Uh, like I can't, I can't wait. He's awesome. And this is his suggestion is by the way as well too. So very excited. Right. That's what he, that's what he wanted to bring on with the show. So I'm very excited about that. So, all right, everybody. Well, let's wrap it up. Um, and before we let you go, we obviously have to bring you home and with, you know, to go bags with a nice old serving of Mommen. inside. So, OK, everybody, have a yeah. good Thanksgiving. Have a great uh, rest yeah. of your week. Um, and we will talk to you all soon and see you on the next one. All right, everybody. So long. Bye bye. New Granada. A perfectly planned community where something strange is happening. Something that wasn't part of the plan. Something that could drive this town over the edge. Over the edge. Rated PG. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> That was wicked, man. <laughs>